Greetings and salutations, boys and girls. This little presentation is digital art from photography and includes some photography tips for those of you who would like to take better pictures with what you currently have. A little background, my entire life since about the age of 10 has been a parallel path of creative endeavors and technology. At the very end of this presentation is a partial client list and a lot of blather that will entertain you right into a lovely sleep. So check it out if you're interested, and if not, you can just pause at the end. I took a couple of art classes in college which simply reaffirmed what I already knew. I cannot draw what I see. But I did learn some valuable compositional rules and techniques which vastly changed the way I saw the world and improved my photography. I highly recommend art classes to all photographers. These are my observations on the subject of art. Adults tend to lose their sense of wonder, having long ago indexed everything they see. If you spend some time observing a toddler, you'll find they're like sponges with sneakers, absorbing every bit of their environment and asking limitless questions, filing all this away for future reference. I try to preserve in myself the childlike wonder exhibited by children's, so I consciously take the time to appreciate my surroundings and examine the minutiae that make up my environment. The images I produce are my attempt to present the magical nature of our surroundings. I hope my work moves you to see your surroundings with new eyes, explore it as a child, and appreciate your world as someone who's been given a second chance at life. Everyone has a need to create. It has been my observation over the seven decades I've spent on this planet that everyone needs to create something to feel fulfilled. And that can be painting or photography, calligraphy, gardening, flower arranging, cooking, as long as you've created something you can point to and say, I made that. It illustrates a sense of purpose and completion. All children are artists. They all have a need to create. Our system, unfortunately, discourages that as they're educated and then they become frustrated accountants. Don't start. I could have said mechanic. Point of view is truly everything. One of the greatest mistakes most photographers make is taking pictures standing straight up. This is the vantage point everyone sees the world from, give or take a few inches. So taking photos standing straight up creates images with no drama, no uniqueness. Taking the photo from the vantage point of a three-year-old, now that has potential. It creates impact. Most people don't see the world from that vantage point unless they fall down a lot. The same is true of a very high point of view. Small children spend a lot of time looking up and down and into. Everything looks bigger and more dramatic from their point of view. You can capture this magic by letting your audience see the world from one of these unique vantage points. Example 1. Point of view is crucial to composition whether you're a painter, photographer, or a graphic artist. It literally makes all the difference. Following are a few examples of what I'm trying to illustrate. Our first slide is the High Line in New York City. It's a very interesting area to explore. The top photo is what anyone would get standing up and snapping the shutter. The bottom view is an ant's eye view. In the upper image, it's not immediately apparent that the floor is awash in water. But looking at it from right above the water, you get to see moving water legs and a completely different view of this particular area. This one's titled Going North. It's an anti view of railroad tracks. I bent over, held my cannon rebel at arm's length, eyeballed the angle roughly and tripped the shutter. And this is what I got. And it's featured in my coffee table book, Texas As I See It. Here's another example. This rusted out water tank doesn't have a lot of artistic merit from casually passing by. But looking straight up the side of it, you get a very different appreciation for its character. The patina from decades of weather, the broken ladder hanging askew, and the intersecting power lines. Laying on the floor of the Guggenheim Museum in New York City will get you this, before they throw you out. A water fountain as viewed from the point of view of a toddler is far more interesting than if you saw the same thing just standing up and looking down into it. You can frame your work with available objects. 
This is the first photo on my coffee table book. Blue bonnets through a fence. Most people shoot over the gate, not through it. They miss out on the dramatic effect of framing the photo with this partially rusted white iron gate. I used this green gate and chain to create perspective in the shot. The dry cracked earth was caused by our drought several years ago. One of my Texas landscape series. This is a view from the top floor of the Embassy Suites Hotel looking straight down. My wife is at one of those tables with zero interest in looking over this railing. You can see why. It's not for everyone. And the title is Vertigo. This is the reason we were at Embassy Suites in the first place, to get exactly this shot of Dr. Pepper Stadium at night. The management gave us a room for the night on the 14th floor to get this shot. I had spent about 15 minutes driving around this stadium one day to try and find the right vantage point and decided the 14th floor of this particular hotel was exactly the right spot. Being an opportunist can result in some great photography. This particular shot is from a construction site in Frisco, Texas. I talked my way into photographing it for three days and this is one of my favorite shots. I saw them setting up to cut this pipe and knew exactly what I wanted, so I got in position and waited. The title of this has been changed from the original to The Package. Women tend to really like this particular shot. You tell me why. Looking up this grain silo is another example of seeing your world like a toddler. Texas Landscape 3. I have a long list of Texas landscapes. Have you ever noticed that all barns are unique? We have literally thousands of them in Texas and no two are alike. This one is also from my coffee table book. Another landscape. Hay wheels and in the distance all that's left of a little old Texas homestead. If you look closely you can see nothing but a stone chimney out at the end. If you edit it out to be extremely different from its native aspect ratio you can get a masterpiece from a snapshot. Well, maybe not entirely a masterpiece, but you're going to see what I mean. The next slide is a great example of cropping dramatically. Texas Landscape 5. The rusty mailbox and orange reflector were what made me pull over on this 75 mile per hour two lane highway. And then the cloud formations, of course. Keeping the mailbox in the foreground creates drama. Barnhart, Texas. We drove through here one day on a of a 2500 mile Route 66 loop and I saw this little gnarled tree and a tired little old house and I thought it was really dramatic but it just didn't quite have the impact I wanted when I processed it. So then I processed it to black and white, solarized it, cropped it and created this which is also featured in my coffee table book and its name is Strange Brew. The crown jewel of Route 66 is inarguably Cadillac Ranch, just west of Amarillo. The concentric rings are artifacts from using a circular polarizer. I could have processed them out, but I liked the effect, so I enhanced it. Here's another view of Cadillac Ranch, and for me this is very reminiscent of the Beatles' Abbey Road cover. Railroad tracks. All photographers are drawn to the vanishing point effect of train tracks. They make for really interesting locations to shoot portraits, models, or just landscapes. Did you know that since 9-11, Homeland Security has decided it is illegal to be on railroad tracks? You can be arrested for doing a photo shoot on railroad tracks. You can also become a statistic because trains are very unforgiving. This Texas Vista is it called Dragonfly Vista because there's a dragonfly in the sky. It was just happenstance, but I kind of liked it. So I could have taken it out, but I left it. Stopping your car on the tracks to get this shot can get you flattened. So look both ways first. I really love the repeating light pattern in this particular shot. It's a Texas State Fair cafeteria back in 2009. And this is the view you would get laying on one of the Coca-Cola themed tables. They're not there anymore. So here's another great lesson. You see something cool, photograph it immediately because the next time you go there, it's probably going to be missing. 
entitled Split Cushion. I thought this chair could probably tell some great stories, part of one of our road trips. And this glass, with condensation and red light shining through it, just looked really interesting. So I grabbed my phone and took this picture. And this is what I got out of it. And this pedal organ at a B&B we were staying at in Texas just looks far more dramatic when viewed from the same vantage point a three or four year old would have as they stood next to it. Be an opportunist. Always have a camera. Most of us have a cell phone anyway. Stopped at a traffic light in dense fog one morning. I captured this particular shot of a construction worker in a cowboy hat digging a trench. Hello OSHA. What could possibly go wrong here? This is a glass wall at a nearby shopping mall at about a 75 degree angle. But wait, there's more. Two of these guys doing what is the completely unsafe approach to caulking this glass. The final touch. I saw these two workers assembling a turret on a new home around sunset, so I settled in and started taking pictures. This particular capture has a very Michelangelo-esque feel to me, and it's entitled The Final Touch. 2000 Degrees. One of my clients recycled precious metals. They told me they were about to do a pour, and would I like to photograph it? Silly question. These are large crucibles, and the one in the back has just been poured with molten gold at 2000 degrees. And this is the furnace they used to smelt the metal with. I entitled it Hell. I'm frequently asked what the best camera is for getting great pictures. My answer has always been the same. It's the one in your hand. If that's an $8,000 Canon rig, terrific. If it's a smartphone, that's also fine. It's never the equipment, it's always the creative process that makes for spectacular images. And the next slide is one example. This was taken with a Samsung Galaxy S5 on a moving boat at night on the Danube. This is the Parliament building in Budapest. It's not the equipment. It's not the equipment. It doesn't matter if your medium is photography, watercolors, pastels, acrylics, or mixed media. Some of the most dramatic work ever created was made with very low-tech equipment and materials. Jackson Pollock created his world-famous abstract art by dousing a horizontal canvas with common house paint. Henri Cartier-Bresson, the godfather of modern photography, used a 35mm Leica rangefinder camera with a 50mm lens for his amazing photographs. The creative process can be made easier or more versatile with a massive arsenal of equipment, but even if you have the best equipment in the world, you can still turn out nothing but expensive snapshots unless you have vision. Seeing the world from a unique perspective produces unique images regardless of the equipment employed. Let's explore the world of digital art. Digital art can be many things. It can involve manipulation of photography. Posterization like the Obama poster created in 2008 is an ex excellent example. It can be hand illustrated images produced on a computer. This is an example by one of my favorite artists in Germany from his Digital Punishment Facebook page. You can combine photography and text, like this example I created a few months ago. A dandelion in the word blow. I also created one that said dandelion with the dandelion in the O. Digital art can also be composited, which is combining multiple images to create something not found in nature. Augmented reality, like I use in my Alien Vista series, and pure abstract art in addition to geometric art. Composites and manipulation of photography are my specialties. I'm an old school pixel editor. The largest commission I've done to date is 26 feet by 6 feet high, and this is a skyline of Dallas and Fort Worth combined for Delta Airlines in 2013. For a sense of scale, this is how big that is. More composites. This is big text at the Texas State Fair. And the picture on the left was the original, which is a pretty good picture of big text, but it's a boring blue sky. And I've got a light post in the way. 
So I replaced this guy and put in the Ferris wheel from elsewhere on the property. The dreaded vanilla sky on the left, solved by replacing this guy and heavily processing the rest to show off this amazing home in Galveston, Texas. This decapitated windmill got my immediate attention, but the boring blue sky and lack of shadow detail needed correction. So, this is the result. Also extreme cropping. Monolithic domes. This place is pretty remarkable. These guys in Texas build these dome houses, and so they put a bunch of them together like a caterpillar off the side of the road. I came in on this at sunset, so no interesting clouds in the sky and basically no color and not a lot of light. The original is on the left, the process version on the right. Again, extreme cropping and a nice new sky. Rendering an image in monochrome and retaining color is called selective color. So the version on the left has this really interesting water trough in red, white, and blue that's been flipped upside down. But I thought it was more interesting when rendered into sepia and then keeping the color in the water trough. The m and sign in New York City. The original on the left is kind of busy. There's a lot going on. So heavily cropping it and moving the major focus to the left and keeping the color in the signs only after turning it to black and white resulted in this. Photoshop has some image distortion filters that almost automate the creation of geometric abstract art. As with any tool, you have to know how to use it, how not to use it, and when to stop. Any art teacher will at some point tell you, the art will tell you when to stop, when it is the very best it can be. You have to listen to your work to know where that point is. It's easy to overdo any treatment. In many cases, most, less is more. If you make your work too busy, it becomes visually overwhelming, so keep this in mind while you're in the process. In the augmented reality category, I use a variety of filters and treatments. Some of my work has literally dozens of layers. How you process each layer has an impact on the final result. Blending techniques can produce some really dramatic, and sometimes unusable, results. Experimentation yields knowledge, so don't be afraid to experiment. Just save your work at each stage, and every time you make a major change, save what you're doing as a new file name so you can go back to a previous good version if you really screw it up. One of my early vortexes. The image used for a recent flyer of a demonstration I did is this particular one. The photo was taken in August 2011 in New York City of the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum sign. So the original is on the left, the process version on the right. Again, I moved the sign over to the left of the image and kept the hand that holds the sign as the main focal point in the center. Then I twisted it into this with the polar vortex effect. I thought the, the, uh, I thought the marquee rushing towards the viewer at the bottom was especially dramatic with a hand in the center. When I decide on an image for processing into my Vortex series, it has to have certain elements that will manipulate well. Parallel lines, vibrant colors, large blocks of definable subject matter. These all translate well when twisted into a design. Some of my Vortexes are simple like this example. All of them are cropped to a square aspect ratio prior to processing because otherwise you can't get symmetricity when producing something like this. Another example. Some exterior stairs in Dallas yielded the result on the right. One of my favorites is this shot of the dining car mock-up at Grand Central Terminal in their downstairs food court. I shot this by resting the camera on the solid oak rail between the boots. Since it's a nice, centric, evenly balanced image, I thought it would do well for a vortex, and I was right. For me, this is very much like Salvador Dali's plastic reality style. Architecture in abstracts. This is a roughly 100 foot long pergola in a nearby township, one of my favorite structures, and I thought it would translate well as an abstract. And sure enough, this is what I got. I love the way 
the uh, roof section of the pergola translated into a heart shape when I was done. Looking down a stairwell, again this is what I mean by point of view. This was a stairwell in Vienna with a frosted glass wall and I thought it would be a really interesting shot looking straight down it, and it is, but it became really interesting as an abstract once it was twirled into a circle pattern and then reproduced multiple times in layers. Everything doesn't have to be square. I like art in diamond shapes because it's really dramatic. You don't see a lot of those. And these particular images, both the square and the diamond shape, are designed to be gridded so you can do several of these on a wall interlocked. It produces really interesting results. But when you turn one into a diamond shape, you sacrifice more than 50% of the content. So you have to decide whether that's worth it. I actually like the square version better of this one. And this one. I don't remember what it came from originally, but everyone sees something different in this particular vortex. And this vortex recently took first place in its category at an Art Society show. It's my most recent creation, and the next slide is the origin of it. An old V8 engine in a 30s vintage car on Route 66 that someone had spray painted with their own creative intent. This one is called Wind Tree, and you'll see why in a minute. Winter trees, part of a commercial photo shoot I did many years ago. Sometimes repetition is all you need, and in this case, I took one image, rotated it, and reproduced it around the center. And yes, it's a Whataburger building. As I said before, the Vortex series is designed to be gridded, and this was the grid we had in our bedroom at our previous home. The Orb. Again, the dramatic aspect ratio here creates some interest, and this is made of a couple of different images. The mirror images above and below were from the first Jimmy Buffett concert in Frisco, Texas, photographed from the top of a building, and in the middle is an unusual translucent tree gall that I found in our driveway. It looked like this. And this is what the concert looked like before cropping and modification. Social distortion. This started out as an image from New York City in 2015. It's the 9-11 Memorial Waterfall, which looks like this. You wouldn't think that, would you? There you go. Social distortion. The Alien Vistas series. I started working on this several years ago by transforming regular old images from nature or cities and tweaking it until it looks like it came from a different planet. This was actually from the mud flats in Alaska from the train on the way to Seward. Texas cinder cones. We have lots of these. Alien River Sunrise. This was taken at sunrise in Little Rock. That's what it looked like. And I use a lot of solarization and many different layers to create these effects alien landscape. Multiple layers, solarization, erasing things that I don't want resulted in this, a very dark and brooding image. Alien teal architecture. This is Taliesin West, Frank Lloyd Wright's home in the Arizona desert and someplace I had wanted to visit for 50 years. This particular one is simply titled The Date I Created It. And this was also taken in Little Rock. So the original image looks like this, which is the result of shooting through a window in a hotel and moving the camera during exposure to get the light streaks. Industrial Aquamarine looks like it's underwater and it's looking up the metal staircase of an abandoned silo farm process to appear like it's underwater, even though it's all rusted iron. Creating a vortex. 
Recently I was looking for an image to create a vortex for this particular presentation and I decided on this one. This is looking down through the Brooklyn Bridge to the deck below with some taxis coming through. And I thought the parallel lines and the bright colors from the taxis would translate well. And it did. This is the final result which is entitled Through the Looking Glass. This one is called Vortex Lacewing. Again, same original image, completely different treatments. So, if you mosey on over to the next video in this series on creating vortexes, you will see how I did this. And, here is some information about me links to different websites and my email address and some background details. Feel free to mosey on over to the video for the other demonstration at this point if you want. But in 1960, our next door neighbor was a ham radio operator who encouraged me to get involved in electronics. Prior to then I'd been more interested in chemistry and blowing things up because it is all about blowing things up, right? I got my first Allied Radio Electronics kit around 1960 and started studying the fundamentals of electronics. I also acquired my first shortwave radio around the same time. My classmates and I used to share notes in Morse code, certain that the nuns could not readily decipher them, and we were probably wrong about that. Around the age of 14, my father taught me the fundamentals of film processing, and from then on I processed all my own black and white film, which made photography much more affordable. I have made my living alternately, sometimes in parallel, as a photographer, calligrapher, and electronics engineer, technician, recording engineer. For the majority of my adult life, the technical and creative fields have overlapped for me, and I test almost exactly 50-50 in right brain versus left brain ability. But then I'm also ambidextrous, so perhaps these two elements are connected. That may have something to do with me playing guitar since I was 14, I don't know. I was a roadie for the Grateful Dead in 1968. I ran JBL's electronics assembly line for a year in 1973 and 74. I was a studio engineer for Motown Records in Los Angeles. I was a recording engineer, acoustic engineer, and studio designer for a long time, almost 20 years. I was part of the design and implementation team for the first computerized house in 1981, and I was with Symantec Corp for three years supporting their project management software. And then I remembered why I'd been independent for 15 years and opened my first computer consulting company in 1995. I do woodworking, welding, and assorted other creative things with physical objects, including our recently upgraded water fountain in our screened-in porch. And there's a video of this independently on my YouTube channel. It's a slag glass water fountain. Here's a partial list of clients. Sly Stone, Boz Skaggs, MC Hammer, members of Journey, Boston, Huey Lewis and the News, and just a lot of other people, including Delta Airlines. I was a skilled calligrapher for many years and still can do that. And I do love to create any number of things in many disciplines, including woodworking, metalworking, and plastics. Uh, painting and drawing is not really my thing, but you know, you can create art with almost anything these days. I taught a photography class for a semester and decided this was not what I wanted to pursue, a valuable lesson for myself. More interesting stuff for you to read on your own. This staff, Slick the Dog and Emperor Julius the Most Bestest who is currently curled up on my desk and wishes to be involved in this process. My Goddess at the Valley of the Gods from a recent road trip. And this is me. So continue on. Please subscribe to my channel so you can see more of what's going on here.